Hi there, and welcome to PIM Pure Science. Let us talk now about some interesting time management strategies applicable to academic environment. First of all, and maybe one of the most difficult but most rewarding strategies is to come early to the lab. This photo here depicts how most, if not all, the research labs look like early in the morning, let's say around 9 a.m. Well, nobody is there. And if you arrive to the lab at, let's say, 8 a.m., you are rewarded with a quiet and very productive start of a new day. Cell culture room is not overcrowded, ice not melted, none of equipment is booked, even a confocal microscope book for 10 a.m. will not be in use until 11. So you are the king of the lab and the equipment. Finally, nobody around to distract you from starting your single most important task for that day especially if this task is not also the most exciting one. Okay, I know that most of you are thinking now that this advice is not for you, since you are a late person and your brain is most productive in the afternoon or the, in the evening. And by implication, you would never function early in the morning. However, psychology research shows that there is no such thing as a morning person or night owl. It is all the matter of habits and time when you go to bed. Sure, you cannot wake up at 6 if you went to bed at 1. But most successful modern entrepreneurs go to bed at 11 p.m. and wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. I, well, I as well lived in the fairy tale of being a night owl for 32 years before I got a kid and realized that not only I can function great at 7, but that my day became somehow longer if I wake up early, although I do sleep the same amount of hours as before. Second strategy is to start your day with your top priority, which you have defined in your time and priority management. This is important to emphasize since it, since it seems to be our nature to start our day by focusing on easiest tasks from our to-do list or the ones that take not so much time. This behavior is probably triggered by an unconscious idea that removing the small task from our to-do list first will enable us to later fully focus on the larger and more complex priority tasks. Unfortunately, by the time we finish those easy to-do tasks, new quickies appear and we may spend the whole day in sorting those things out having no time and energy by the end of the day for the things that really matter. To say no, but politely. Of course, saying no in many cultures and environments may sound impolitely and even hostile, and may even be a sign of incompetence. But to properly manage and defend your time, you need to learn how to say it. The trick is not to say directly, but indirectly. You should of course never say, sorry, I don't have time. You should start with, you know, I will do anything for you, but right now I have this urgent thing to finish, so let me call you back. And in that time, you are not saying it really, but you are postponing it for later when you can actually plan the task. Of course, sometimes you cannot say no, especially if it comes from your boss. Now, making good habits and routines like coming early in the morning or having a focal microscope always booked in the same time is very important. This is because anyone who did research know that 80% of daily tasks are quite boring. Except you are not in love with pipetting, cell culture, medium exchange, endless counting of fluorescent dots and stuff like that. Unfortunately, some of these boring tasks are also those important but not urgent ones. So one may have a hard time convincing oneself that it is right now the right time to work on these. Especially if we have some other urgent things to do. Habits and routines will help us do this stuff. Placing this important boring task first in our daily schedules or scheduling them always in the same time will shut down our brain's urge to think and hesitate and will make them easier to conquer. Maybe the most difficult strategy to accept, especially by senior academics, is that, that there is no need to be perfect in your work. When I say not perfect, I refer to 2080 Pareto principle, 
meaning that 20% of your work accounts for 80% of accomplishment. The rest of time we are using to polish things perfect. Well, here is an example. Well, everybody will agree that your first submission to nature should be best as possible. It does not need to be perfect. First of all, whoever published ever in a nature knows that the last version of the published manuscript has nothing to do with the originally submitted one. Hence, making figures perfect and waiting every sentence is just a waste of time. Conclusions need to be sound and figures clear, and you can do that with 20% of your perfect version effort. Even worse, with the current nature acceptance rate and an average of seven submissions to various journals before final acceptance, makes a perfect perfection obsession a very time consuming. You should also adapt the working environment to become time management friendly. For example, inventing a sign that will signal that you are very busy and if the lab is not burning or so, your colleagues should not disturb. Closed office doors, for example, will usually do the trick. You should also make a Google or other kind of web-based calendar and share it with your friends so they know where and when to find you, if they need you, and when to leave you alone. Also, when collaborating, don't simply lean on time management and deadline meeting capabilities of your colleagues, but be proactive and always inquire about project progress. Don't wait for the day before the deadline to ask where the heck is the report. Well, you can also buy time. Yes, you heard me right. Time is money, right? So if you have money, buy time. For example, a kit will save you on time. The problems with kit or kits is that usually we use the kits not only to save time, but to do more experiments in the same time. And this unfortunately applies to all time saving equipment in our labs. Well, just remember the donkey and a carrot story and use the kits wisely. You could also get yourself an undergrad student. Of course, initially you will need to invest some time into this person, but eventually he or she will become your second pair of hands. Again, you can use this person to either help you to do more or to do the same in less time. This is especially helpful if you need to finish some no-brainers, which would appear to your undergrad as flight to the moon. And everybody is happy. Finally, learn how to properly collaborate. Make people excited about your project and learn how your expertise may be useful to others. While proper teamwork needs continuous time investment, trust that gets built in this process may save you a lot of time in future. Just think about a friendly insider tip during your job hunt. Well, how many times in your life have you heard to work smarter and not harder? However, this is usually connected with a certain product and not the process. And while indeed using EndNote as opposed to typing all references in, in your manuscript can save you quite a bit of time, concentrating on the process holds even greater promise. One important example I can give here is to read more instead simply increasing the number of data points. Where we all would argue that not knowing somebody else did and published experiments you are currently running would be a waste of your time, James Watson argues that we, scientists, produce already so much data that by careful reading and knowledge synthesis, we will be now able to design a single experiment to test and answer some of the great questions in life sciences. Or in other words, Imagine doing one experiment and publishing it in nature. Well, that would be a time saver advice. Thanks, James. Finally, no time management presentation would be complete without mentioning top five time thieves, which are so common and present in our daily lives that we don't even consider how much time we waste on these. Number one is working at home. Well, if you can resist TV, phone, fridge, your bed or sofa, chat with roommates or a partner, loud neighbors, kids running around, too comfortable energy of your home, 
then this is the right thing for you. And hopefully you have an extra room dedicated especially for your work at home. If you are like the rest of us mortals, then staying at home to work is as efficient as actually going to work and doing nothing. Except we are working on urgent important things, like grand deadline in two days or so. Otherwise, my advice is that if your working environment in your lab or in your office is too distracting for your concentration on reading or writing or thinking, then go to the library. Number two. Okay, let's first clarify one thing. A second never lasts a second long. Even a question, do you have a second, takes two seconds to be posed. So whenever somebody interrupts you for a sec, and this can happen many times during the day, you're not losing seconds, but possibly hours. More importantly, these interruptions kill the flow of thoughts that may lead some of you to the next Nobel Prize experiment or a hypothesis. And if that thought disappears because of an interruption, well, I'm sorry. Anyway, in these situations, when you are at the peak of your creativity and someone interrupts, you can simply reply, of course, but not right now. Why don't you come in an hour or so? If it is important, they will come. If not, well, they will find another chat to vic uh, victim to chat. But don't forget, interruption may be also helpful. For example, you are thinking about how to fit a new data set in your revised manuscript and having a hard time. Well, an interruption here would be welcomed, since it kills the flow of your thoughts that was not helping your situation. But after a cake or a coffee, you may start thinking about the issue from a different angle. Happened to me. Number three, the internet. Well, if you use nuclear power well, you can get a lot of usable energy. When the same power gets out of control, you get a destructive power of an A-bomb. And the same holds for internet, for checking your emails and internet news. While of course both are source of information if used well, both are also powerful time waster if out of control. While one can easier stop looking at news, email checking is, you know, it's addictive because there is always this hidden thought that something important may arrive. Well, do you really think that your wife on her way to the delivery room will email you to tell you to come to the hospital as soon as you read the email? Nope. So relax and check emails once per day or maybe twice, but not the first thing in the morning. And remember, important things will always reach you, also without the internet. Number four, the social networking platforms. Well, the photo here depicts only a few of them, and although these are useful tools to stay in touch with your friends and have some fun time online, if not used properly and out of work, may eat up your precious productive time. I have also noticed that while many young professionals have great and always up-to-date Facebook profiles, the professional profiles, like those on LinkedIn, stay quite rudimentary. And exactly those profiles are selling your and your skills and achievements. Finally, while everybody may have their own opinion about social media, psychologists say that to build a real network of trusted people, you need to go to know you need to know those people in flesh. So you should move your ass a bit from your damn computer. Finally, be aware of changing environment. Well, I have seen so many times people working hard on things that used to be, but they're not anymore, their life and professional priorities. It is obvious that we are constantly changing and by that our life and professional goals change as well. But it seems hard for scientists to adjust quickly to those changes. Unfortunately, I have met so many postdocs being in the lab 24-7, although they are not any more passionate about research and academic career. Well, if this is not a major waste of time, then what is it? So question your priorities from time to time and act quickly to adjust your time and priority schedule to these emergent changes. Because don't forget that time management is all about a happy and focused scientist 
that knows how to act based on his or her priorities. Finally, I would like to address an academic taboo topic. Should you work or not during the weekends? Well, from my experience, many supervisors would encourage you to do it, because this is what real and successful scientists are doing. However, with proper time management, you can have your weekends free for your extracurricular activities, whatever they are. My advice is to protect your free weekends no matter what. The rationale is that unlike others, you are taking time management seriously and you are able to finish a seven day job in five days and you have all rights to use these two extra days to your wish. You deserve it.